Christians around the world. <laughs> nice. Wonderful. 216, it's climbing. Registrants are Ravia, Spain. Hola. Singapore. Sweden. Let's go ahead and dive in. I think we have a wonderful group here and people will keep joining probably over the next five, 10 minutes anyway. So to start off, welcome everybody. This is by far a larger turnout than we could have ever imagined. Um, when we were first talking about this, this panel at first, we were thinking maybe 20, 30, 40 people. So thank you so much for taking your time today to come through and hear what we have to talk about. So to first, I wanna take a second and set the intention of this panel. We're all here to discuss company culture for remote teams. And as the landscape has shown, there are some common threads or trends in remote work that everyone's facing that are hurdles that are a little difficult to adjust to. It's a new way of life for many. And even those companies that are remote first and they've always been remote first still see some issues uh, with, with maintaining their culture. Um, while as on the other side, companies that are requiring their employees to return to the office, they're being met with resistance, petitions, I think Apple just got a petition from their employees to not return to the office. About a thousand people signed that. And of course, resignations. The, the new trend on Twitter is quiet quitting, which I believe is something also known as coasting. So there's a lot of discrepancy in, in this space right now. So we're here to share our knowledge and the panelists we've assembled have been running remote teams for most of their careers and have seen everything. So for those of you looking to further develop your culture, hear from the experts, get some best practices, uh, this is for you. To introduce myself, I am Matt Young. I'm the founder of Nomadic Six. And over the past five years, I've been specializing in spaces designed for human thriving. That's kind of a mouthful, but generally what we do is we host location independent travelers and remote workers in environments that are conducive for living, for working, uh, collaborating, experiencing foreign cultures, et cetera. Now we are building programs for remote teams to reconnect. In addition to our creme de la creme offer is our 30 day remote leaders intensive program. That is coming up in November. It's gonna be based in Sitges, just outside of Barcelona. And we are currently accepting applications up until the end of the month. So if that interests you, we'll talk about it a little bit more at the end of the event and answer any questions you may have. So we're gonna start off by giving the floor to each panelist. They're going to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their experience and their work. Uh, we'll transition into a discussion section with some, some fun questions around the themes that we've all seen uh, from you guys. And then at the very end, we'll go into a live Q&A uh, with, with you. So without further ado, Joining us today, we have Andrew Jernigan. He is the CEO of Insured Nomads. We have Ivo Sapar, the CEO of Remote Howl. Virginia Scapinelli, a senior consultant at the Bassoon Project and an advisor at CoLive. And finally, Mr. Chase Warrington, the head of remote at Doist. We also have our wonderful experienced strategist with us. Her name is Caroline Melly, and she'll be here kind of playing background administration, fielding any questions chatting with you guys and running our Q&A at the end of the event. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew. Uh, thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Insured Nomads. I'm joining you today from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the US. And our team is globally distributed working from South Africa, Thailand, London, um, U.S. And, and other parts around the world. So from wherever you are, uh, it's been great seeing your shout outs today. I have been doing remote work for quite some time, uh, for over 20 years. And one of those remote teams, I was living in Ghana, West Africa, uh, with the home office. And most of the team was in, in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And, you know, those real life experiences that we would gather and with our team members were priceless. 
Today, you're going to hear about different things like that um, and some, some nuggets that you'll walk away from from some of the panelists. And I count it as an honor to be here with you because I, I'm learning every day from new software, new tools that are being built, others in the industry, and, and from the experiences that are being had. So this is going to be fun. Um, I thank you for the invitation, Matthew, and, and look forward to learning from each of you. Thank you, Andrew. Very happy to have you. Uh, Ivo, would you like to go next? Of course, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Ivar Shapar, and uh, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Remote Hall, where since 2018, so it's quite some time we've been uh, helping thousands of companies worldwide uh, make remote work work through education and, and consulting. Uh, and recently, a couple of months ago, we co-founded the not-for-profit initiative called Remote First Institute, where we are on the mission to fight with the global back to the office movement. So we are gathering the community uh, and, uh, and, and making sure that we will have a freedom of choice where we work. Um, our team has been distributed from from the day one spread across the world uh, and the companies that we've been working with uh, small startups uh, giant corporations like walmart etc they're also going into this direction so it's uh, really exciting to see how the world is changing although there are still people trying to <laughs> fight this change uh, but here we are to show the best practices uh, uh, to show how companies like Dewis, for instance, uh, have been doing remote work uh, for years and are super successful. So I'm extremely happy to, to be here. So happy to have you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know you're going to, so I was going to have to leave us at the top of the hour just to get everyone the quick heartbreak before we, we get yeah, there. There's another panel that I need to join. I'm so sorry. No, no worries. I'm, we'll, we'll, we're happy you're here while, while we have you. Um, Virginia, would you like to go next? Yes. Thank you a lot, Matt, for having me. And uh, super glad to be part of this today. Today, I'm going to be wearing a couple of hats. The first one is being part of a remote team. The second one is um, helping companies and teams thrive. So um, two points of view, uh, which I believe will be interesting to share with you today. First hat is um, being member of uh, CoLive, uh, team member of CoLive. CoLive is the largest uh, distributed no-profit organization um, that empowers uh, co-living professionals. So our mission is really to um, put, bring forward the movement in the co-living scene. And, and, as, of, and as, of, as of today, we are 10 team members that are distributed. We don't have offices. We are 40 plus ambassadors in five continents. We are 400 uh, affiliates, members of uh, the association and 10,000 uh, co-living enthusiasts. So glad, I will be glad to share more about uh, how this, uh, this works and has worked with us, especially between um, having a bottom-up approach on how to run this um, giant uh, organization, um, about how to have um, and uh, have a, a sense of community and build a sense of community within the organization, which is uh, completely distributed. And uh, second hat that I will be wearing today is uh, collaborating with the Bosom Project, which is a French-based uh, consultancy in change management. If you are um, not familiar with uh, what that is, it's basically um, accompanying uh, organizations in uh, their business challenges and uh, allowing them to thrive thanks to the empowerment of their human um, components, which is employees. So um, we, uh, we, uh, we help companies thriving by working and empowering employees. Very curious, very, uh, very uh, grateful to be uh, with, uh, with you guys today. I'm relatively new to the remote scene, but uh, it seemed to me that the, the, the remote first uh, company practices that uh, are 
um, sort of uh, pushing the industry today in the remote scene will be coming um, very much the norm uh, in the general work industry. So very curious to, to see how uh, this uh, best practices will be spread around the, around the globe. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Virginia. And last but not least, Mr. Chase Warrington. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so good to, to see all of you again, and some of you for the first time, many of you, many again uh, for the second or third or fifth time, Iwu. We've been on a couple of these together. Um, it's really awesome to be here. I'm Like Andrew, I'm excited to learn from the panelists and uh, from the audience and the questions here. Uh, it's sort of a big part of my job. I'm the head of remote at Duist, uh, which is a fully distributed team across. We have about 100 people in 35 different countries, and we've been remote first since the beginning um, of our inception, so 15 years now. So remote's been a very big part of our DNA as a company, and it's now my job to really take us to the next level of being a, a remote first team. So that dynamic has changed completely over the last couple of years, what it means to be remote, the tools, the tech, the, uh, the best practices being shared. And so I spend a lot of my time sharing what we do at Duist and how we make that work. And then also learning from people like those of you on this, uh, on this panel so that I can take that back and, and you know, spread it within Duist. So um, I'm really excited to, to be here to share what we've learned along the way and, uh, and hopefully pick up some new things uh, as, as well. So yeah, very excited. Thank you. Wonderful. So as you can see, everyone here is fantastic. They're so gratefully, or I'm so grateful for you guys being here firstly. Uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, I've been following you for quite a long time. I won't fanboy too hard, but uh, I am happy that you've decided to come join this event. So before we dive into our little discussion section, I do wanna make a special shout out to our uh, two sponsors. Firstly, uh, Citizen Remote. They are a wonderful group of guys based uh, over in Europe. They are your home during a life on the road from their extensive resource on digital nomad visas to their app aimed at helping you make the most of your remote lifestyle. Citizen Remote is here to help you build your borderless world. I realize this is gonna sound like a, a podcast advertisement and it's my fault, but here we are. Uh, second, big shout out to Group Greeting. They are an employee appreciation company. Nearly 95% of Fortune 500 companies use Group, group Greeting to send their e-cards, uh, which are perfect for remote work environment. All members of a team can sign a card regardless of their location and send to employees for thank yous, birthdays, special rec recognitions, and 30 more other occasions. So if you use promo code Nomadic6, you will get 50% off a single card for the month of September. Uh, this only applies for new customers. A little asterisk there. Ads. Gotta love ads. So <laughs> let's go to the question section. You guys ready? Let's do it. Wonderful. So this question is uh, generic for all. Uh, if you guys want to go one at a time or if you want to uh, take the lead on it, by all means, feel free to just give it a little hand raise. Uh, so how would, you, how would you define company culture and how would you define connectedness versus culture? You want to call well, someone? I'm going to hand it to Andrew first. Yeah, it's one of those things. Company culture is is a, has everyone's signature in it. Sure, it's it's led by by the the foundation of the company, but yet everyone gets to to give their flavor as they're part of the company, and that comes in positive and negatives because as people experience different things, it can easily sway the culture. And so keeping that ship, um, keeping the entity, the, the living, breathing um, entity on a positive direction is, is not just the leadership, but everyone's responsibility in a sense. Uh, I, although that can be taken too far in that it's not everyone's responsibility to maintain the culture. It's, it truly is the leadership and the management because some people can't take that on and it's not their their role to do it. So I'd, I'd love to hear everyone else's take on that because it, it can, it's one of those things to where it has to be curated. And um, those who are curating it, those who are leading it, 
uh, have such a, a large role in that, but yet everyone has a, a stake in what the culture becomes. Something we try to do at, at Duist, you know, I, I think this is one of the things that distinguishes remote teams from, from in-office teams, and you can mix hybrid in there as well, but organizations that are distributed in some model, it's really the leadership's opportunity or obligation really to create those opportunities for people to, to build culture. Um, when you're in an office, when you're in a co-located environment, your culture becomes a lot of what happens within that office. And it can be, that can be a good or a bad thing, depending on the environment that takes place in the office. But when you're in a remote organization, there, you don't have those shoulder to shoulder bump ins. You don't have the ver proverbial water cooler. You don't have a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. So while everybody has a stake in it and everybody can create it, I think it's really important that leaders within the organization take the opportunity to say, okay, how are we going to create those moments, those serendipitous moments for people to connect? How are we going to create those opportunities for people to, to brush shoulders, so to speak, and to, and to build deeper bonds? And, and that takes a lot of intentionality that, um, that a lot of teams coming from an in-office environment and transitioning to a remote environment don't always realize that they have to shift the mindset from, oh, this will just happen. We'll just put a few bullet points in place and it'll kind of just happen to, oh no, we actually have to intentionally create these aspects and, and, uh, and build that out for our team. And that's how the culture will, will thrive and, and flourish from there. Wonderful. Wonderful. I have a, <clears throat> did you have a response? All right. On, on my end, I, I tried to come up with a definition of what is uh, company culture. And uh, the response that I uh, gave myself is how people work together to uh, reach common goals. So that's the most simple way that we can define uh, culture. And uh, to me, there is uh, at least three levels uh, to the components of, of company culture. So there is the, the personal level, which is really about um, how you show up, how those people show up in the working environment, their beliefs, their behaviors, their motivations, what makes them want to perform tasks at work. And um, at least, uh, at second layer, I would say it's the team uh, level, which is about all those uh, social moments and collaboration moments that makes you work together uh, and uh, achieve results and make collabor collaboration flow. And then there is the third level, uh, which is the company level, which is the, all those soft and hard rules that the company sort of um, asks you to follow uh, in order to create structure, in order to uh, make the whole organization work, which is dress code, uh, office uh, setup, if you have uh, benefits, all this basically is company culture that makes um, in the end a great employee experience. Uh, this is what you want to achieve. So people that are greatly engaged, that feel uh, fulfilled and so forth, you want to achieve high levels of productivity and camaraderie, camaraderie. Um, and ultimately at the company level, you want to achieve good reputation and be uh, attracting talent. So that's kind of the results of having a, a good culture. That's my, that's my own uh, take on this. Wonderful. Can I add one more thing, Matt, before we move on? Sure. I I, th I think it's really easy also sometimes for us to connect culture with, with all the things exterior of work. Um, we think about culture and we think about like company happy hours, or we think about the, the company retreats or something like that. Um, but I think it's also really can be really useful to reflect on the fact that like the, the culture of the company is actually mostly defined by how we work together. So the, the, we at Duist, at least like we've really subscribed to the mentality that we're a team, we're not a family and we 
Um, you know, we spend a lot of time, we, we put a lot of intentionality around how do we collaborate together? How are we going to spend time uh, connecting with each other in different ways around the work that we do? And that really builds out our culture much more than some of the things on the periphery. So it's a mix of the two. It's not one or the other. It's not like black and white, but it is really important, I think, to reflect on like the culture is of a, most teams is primarily comprised of, of how we, how we connect around the work, which is the thing that like really unites us. Absolutely. And I find it, I do find it interesting when I think of company culture, there's a certain sense of values that come into play. Are your individual values aligned with company values? Are you somebody who's working towards a shared goal, individual goal? And I think it's really important for companies to, you know, not only express their values, but also you know, honor the values of, of their teams. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. Uh, are there new roles that have emerged uh, that companies are hiring to facilitate company culture? It's kind of a low ball. I mean, Chase is one of those roles, but yes. uh, <laughs> tell, me more. <laughs> tell, tell me more about that. <laughs> yes, we have one of the most famous uh, people uh, who is a head of remote uh, in, the, in the world. Yeah. So what we see is that because going remote, going hybrid is such a complex uh, process, there needs to be an owner. Um, for smaller organizations, it can start as a, as a project where you adjust the uh, processes and, and you build this up for a couple of months for, and then probably HR or operations uh, can support or, or take over. But for larger teams, there needs to be an owner uh, forever. Uh, and this owner will be even building their own team uh, whilst uh, once the company grows. So um, actually, this is something that we started to see before the pandemic, uh, that, that the teams realized that even though they are already remote, uh, but because they grow, because things change, because you need to keep improving uh, how the organization is run, um, we kept seeing either on the operational side, so people that were heavily involved in, in building processes, setting up uh, tool stacks, uh, automating things. And then there is the other part, more on the, on the HR side of the building, um, head of community, chief happiness officer. Um, but what's changing right now is that uh, these positions uh, need to get um, real impact on how things are, are going because oftentimes uh, it was uh, more of a wishful thinking and we would like to do something but then there was no uh, internal buy-in and because there's always a deadline and the project then the revenue needs to go up this kind of things um, that there is truly about uh, relearning redoing things uh, internally uh, were skipped so what we are big believers in is that uh, this is a pure change management process that is painful. There will be a lot of blood and tears for, for most companies. So if you want to go to be serious about that, uh, invest time, invest resources, have people that will guide you through uh, through this journey. Uh, might be external uh, people that will hire. Um, it might be someone from your team that would like to become your head of remote. Um, but at the end of the day, this is the only way to go. Uh, because this is such a complex process, uh, leadership development, uh, operations, uh, all the HR stuff. We talked about uh, the culture in the beginning, and those are just uh, just a few. Um, so if to some of you the, the title Head of Remote sounds uh, interesting, um, we are actually exploring as the Remote First Institute to uh, run such program uh, to help people upskill themselves uh, as, as Head of Remote. So I will do a sneaky plugin here. And there is a survey that you can fill out. It will take three minutes. And if you're interested, uh, we are right now exploring this. So if you're interested, let us know what will be your expectation mm, because we want to upskill thousands of people in, in upcoming years to, uh, to lead the change because this is one of the, one of the aspects how, um, how we can fight uh, for the remote first future. And Chase, maybe there will be statues of yours in a couple of years in different parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will make sure true. there's at least one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's standing next to your mind. statue, Ivo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it could be a shared one. <laughs>
Wonderful. We should all get statues at some point in our lives. I mean, just just to see if they make it two thousand <laughs> years, right? You participate in this panel, you get a statue. It's you know everybody gets a trophy right. nowadays. <laughs> yes, or at least NFT. Exactly. <laughs> there we go, NFT. So something I want to talk about. Uh, a lot of people did ask uh, about new team members. So Andrea, I want to I want to kind of direct this one towards you. Uh, how are companies facilitating learning and development for new team members? And beyond that, how are companies breaking the ice with new team members? And what are the uh, best practices for onboarding them? Oh, I, I, I'm honored to have the question asked of me, but I would so like to hear from others on this as well. Um, you know, we just this morning, we welcomed a new team member on a global call that uh, they got to introduce themselves. They're Australian that is uh, just relocated to Europe and be working remotely there with insured nomads. Uh, they this was done in a um, in an environment called Cozy, Cozy Office, and uh, they get to got to tell more about themselves, but they're also having one-on-one -on -one calls with lots of the folks on the team, encouraged to just uh, interact with folks all around the world, get to know them no matter what role they're in. And uh, sure, we have an internal newsletter, things go out that way, which is much more traditional, but uh, bringing folks on board, I think in a place where they're not gonna get to see a lot of people is um, really crucial to have those phone calls, uh, to be able to uh, have those times that are not async, aren't just messaging back and forth, but to have those uh, Zoom teams, other interactions so that they can actually meet, um, meet people, at least virtually, because otherwise it's just another blog they're reading. It's another Slack channel. It's another um, virtual experience. And we've got to make it real world, even though, sure, there's some real world experiences that, that will happen. And, but we've got to do all we can. There, there are platforms like Lattice and HiBob and, and others where there's learning and development that can take place. But um, yeah. That's, that's my two cents on that aspect, and I'll pass it on because I'd like to hear uh, some of the insights from some of the others. Yeah, does anybody want to take the, take the floor? I'd be happy to share what we do at, at Duis. Um, this is an element of, this is one of the things at Duis that we felt like, you know, after 10 years of functioning as a, as a, most startups do, just trying to figure things out and just kind of building the airplane as you fly it. We realized, oh, our onboarding is, is not really optimized for remote first. So we went back, we revised it. We thought deeply about how do you do onboarding in a, in a remote environment? This was probably five or six years ago. And we, we came up with a whole new, uh, a whole new mousetrap that works a whole lot better for us. Uh, one of the things that I, we talked about with the first question was like your, your company culture, right? And what does that mean? At Duis, part of our company culture is being heavily asynchronous. So we're a, we are a, on the asynchronous to synchronous spectrum. We are way far on one end of that with as far as how we communicate. We're, we're very focused on asynchronous communication. We have very few meetings, very few calls. Um, we're distributed all around the world. So it just doesn't make sense for us. So we do everything on a, on a very asynchronous basis. So we formatted our onboarding to be very heavily focused on asynchronous. One of the things that we switched was like, we used to have an onboarding call where somebody would kind of like present to themselves, share a few things about themselves, stand up, do something like we're doing here with five or six people. But we switched that to an asynchronous format. On some level, you could say it's much less personal. Um, and so we tried to compensate for that with, with something that I'll touch on in a second. But on the other hand, what we did was we gave people an insight into this is how we work every day. We work via the written form and we want you to introduce yourself via the written form. And what that gave us was like uh, a, a, a format where people share 10 interesting facts about themselves, for example, one of the fir their first task when they first get hired at Duist, share 10 interesting facts. It would be really painful to watch somebody do that in a live setting. They would get up and awkwardly run through 10, 10 quick things. And then that information would be lost for forever. 
Instead, these people share 10 really well thought out long form stories about themselves that people can really connect with and people can think about and refer back to later. And so this kind of like epitomizes how we work because we're, we work in a very similar way. Um, and, and now we're watching bonds being built from day one uh, around, around these activities. So we went back and thought through all of the activities just like that one. That's just one of them. There's a Todoist project, which is one of our, uh, an onboarding project, which is one of our tools. And this task list basically takes the new hire through around 50 actions over a three month period. And those actions tie them to other people. It gets them to do live synchronous calls one-on-one -on -one with other people to build deep, deep relationships there. It gets them to read blog posts, articles, join channels and threads that would be relevant to them. Um, and so all of this is somewhat automated, somewhat synchronous, somewhat asynchronous, but the core factors of it really tie to, to our culture. And then the last thing that I'll mention is that we added in a mentorship trip. So it's very rare that we get to spend time with each other in person, but it's super crucial early on. This is what Andrew was alluding to as well. It's really uh, important early on that people feel connected to the company in a really deep way and really get off on the right foot. So we fly that new hire to go visit uh, their mentor and spend a week with their mentor, um, wherever that mentor is in the world. And, and they spending that week with them, getting them off on that foot has, has made a huge, uh, a huge difference. So there's a lot more that we could go into, but that's some of the, the high level bullet points uh, that hopefully shed some, some light on what we're doing. Amazing. Um, I will say you've written quite a lot about this too, uh, Chase. So if anybody's looking for like more information, all these guys have published works and articles and things on this stuff. So definitely recommend checking them out. So next question, if you guys are ready to move on. Virginia, were you going to add something? Sorry, I, yes, I wasn't I, sure I was, if I, I cut you off. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Virginia. I, I was going to add something that you inspired me, uh, Chase. I would argue that um, obviously every company has its own in onboarding process that fits to their culture and, and so forth. Um, I would got, argue that that onboarding process starts even before day one meaning that you want to make sure that the people that you will onboard on day one are 100% uh, in line with the type of culture, the type of uh, uh, interaction styles and so forth that you will be having from day one so that the actual onboarding process happen uh, smoothly and uh, in the end, every, there is no surprises, everybody is happy. So um, I would say that you start, your start onboarding a person during the interviews, if you want. You're starting to welcome that, that person in your company and you're starting to explain what is going to happen next. So yeah, it's, it's nice to see how I think uh, you want to uh, convey uh, those, those, those elements of onboarding before day one. Great point. Yeah, wonderful. Hmm. Intriguing. I always think about too, only to stay on this, because I am curious, how do you usually go about the team members that are a little bit more introverted? Uh, and this maybe this doesn't necessarily apply to new team members, but generally engaging those that are a little more you know, reclusive, they're not really engaging in the chats, they're not, you know, really putting their themselves out there. Is there, have you seen this before? How are you, uh, how are you kind of coaxing the, the quiet ones, if you will? Yeah, I can actually take this one. Um, so one of the ways to do remote write is a personalization. So we need to first start with a mindset that everyone is different uh, and we need to provide different experience. Uh, so in the old days, uh, everyone was uh, put in the same bag and we're providing that employee experience um, as if we are all the same. And remote is, is different and we know it's tougher because it's uh, <laughs> you need more time resources and, uh, uh, and, and it's simply not that easy. And that's also one of the reasons why companies want uh, people to go back to the office so everyone is in the same room and we're providing uh, similar, similar experience. When it comes to introverts, uh, the interesting uh, fun fact is, and um, I actually 
heard this from uh, last week from a person that worked for Automatic, so the builder of WordPress and the company that was distributed for many, many years uh, before pandemic, they were one of the next to do is the, uh, the, the, the leading companies. And uh, they were mainly hiring introverts uh, with, a good, with good writing skills. Uh, and of course, it was not written anywhere. <laughs> but from the person that was that was working there, were like that was the um, one of, one of the most common uh, common profiles, and uh, that worked super well for them. So I would say that you shouldn't sh- try to change people uh, always. Um, of course, there are some boundaries and processes that that some people need to follow. Like the bottom line is that people like to work for you. Uh, or with you start their day and they're not oh oh my god when is friday no like this is this is the bottom line um and then you need to personalize it because uh, i remember chase we talked about the this one guy in your company that no one ever seen uh on a call (laughs) and to me it's like mind-blowing right there is a person working with you and you've never seen this person on any of the calls right it was like fully async um so that would be that would be my take to to really figure out how you can serve different uh, different personas um, because this is this is the way to go. Oh, you're muted, Mister Mister Chase. I was just thinking out loud. Um, <laughs> I think I, I was just going to add that I think one of uh, for for some reason this I've I've seen this kind of fly under the radar a good bit. And I think it can be interesting to reflect on, but remote can be really well suited and, and is really well suited for, for introverts. I think the office environment actually like stifles a lot of people who are introverted or, or perhaps a lot of creatives who aren't the, going to be the first one to speak up or the loudest to speak up in a meeting. Um, but in an async remote environment, they can really find their voice. And, and so I think that's something really like a superpower that enables a lot of remote teams to succeed at a super high level is because you have a very high percentage of people in your workforce who would identify as introverts. And if you suddenly unlock a situation where they all feel good about their ability to contribute and to respond on their time and to think through their thoughts and share them in a, uh, in a well thought out way, I, th- I think it, it just unlocks a lot of potential, not just for the company to thrive, but also like those individuals can thrive and, and therefore continue to rise up through the company, whereas they may have been held back a little bit in, in another environment. So sometimes we don't, I don't know, it doesn't really get talked about a whole lot, but I think it's something that's, that's a, a really nice kind of side bonus to, to this infrastructure. Amazing. Superpower. I love it. I've always kind of identified as introvert. So this is a wonderful exercise for me to be speaking to all you guys and 300 people currently. But uh, yeah, I agree. I, I've always enjoyed kind of being the guy in the back uh, who kind of observes. Um, yeah, on the flip side, though, though, Chase and Matthew, I'd love to hear the the aspect to where how can you push that extrovert who wants to pick up a phone, who wants to have that live interaction uh, how are you able to get that extrovert to be more async and respect time zones and and live in that truly remote asynchronous uh, method of working? Anybody else want to go? <laughs> it's a it's a challenge uh, a uh, when, I, when there's some folks just... who really want to pick up the phone again i had one yeah. at five this morning before i had my first cup of coffee but it was not five in the morning for them and <laughs> it's like nope can't take the call right now what yeah, works uh, typically is uh, sorry if i'm interrupting chase um is to put in the same room different types of people with different personalities and make them uh, spend a little moment talking on how they wish to interact so that they are able to speak for themselves on, uh, you know, I'm an introvert and this is how I'm feeling when we are in this kind of situation and I would really like Um, And I would feel safer if this and that and that would happen. And I would really love to uh, speak and interact like that. And I'm an extrovert and 
uh, this is how I um, would prefer uh, to uh, to work and to interact. And someone is sort of like finding the right balance between the between all this, um, so that everyone has been heard, everyone had the chance to uh, you know showcase their uh, their point. And uh, there is someone external who tries to find a balance in all this. It's really yeah. about communicating. Yeah. And, and, and I also would ask a question if this picking up the phone is calling is a bad habit in how you communicate within the company. So people still have this tendency for like ad hoc meetings and calls. And I need to know this right now, although you don't because this workshop is in four weeks and we don't need to be interrupted right now uh, versus having a platform where people can interact with each other. And it doesn't need to be business related. That can be an internal networking or whatever type of event where people can freely speak, right? Um, but also one thing that I'm an extrovert, so I will speak for myself. <laughs> um, so if, if I would be my employer, uh, I would ask Evo if, if I have a space, if I have a platform where I can use my energy and, and the willingness to talk. And if I don't, then I would figure out, okay, maybe we should uh, give you some budget to attend some events, conferences, meetups. Maybe you wanna host one. Maybe you wanna work from co-working space where you can go for a coffee and have a random chat with bazillions of people between your, your breaks, right? So um, really ask questions and, and figure out if, if this is a bad habit around remote work, or this is just the lack of the, the proper uh, habits in, in inside the company uh, and, and having a place where people can can connect with each other. Yeah, and I, th I think this comes back to like uh, something we referenced earlier, where you have to intentionally create these opportunities and, and those opportunities to connect on a more human synchronous face to face level um, should always be optional. And in a remote environment, giving people that want and crave that uh the extroverts of us here that really want that and, and need that from our our teams and maybe that's part of why we're on a team is because we crave that human interaction so let's not be robots and just you know close ourselves off but if you are a robot and you do just want to close yourself off you have that option too so we as a leadership kind of create those opportunities for people to connect socially and and synchronously both in person and virtually and then, um, you know, and also allowing the people who have zero interest in that and just want to get their work done and then move on to the rest of their life. Um, that's fine too. And I, I think embracing that is, is, uh, is perfectly okay. I also think it's good to remember that people get that human connection from a lot more places than just work. Uh, and so by embracing the, the remote and async, um, style of work, you, you open people up to, to, you know, much, much fewer hours that they have to focus on their work and be surrounded by the confines of, of just their office, whether it be virtual or, or in a real office, they have a life outside of work. And so giving people options to, to go do community service days or giving people the ability to go work at a co-working space or, or sending people on, on trips to go connect with other teammates, um, whatever it may be, you, know, you, can, you can provide these things so that people on remote teams do have the opportunity to go connect with people both outside of work and inside of work. I saw a comment from somebody in our chat over here. Uh, it's something we've kind of played with a little bit too is uh, building user manuals for ourselves. And a user manual, it's, it's a little bit beyond the dating profile. It's, you know, here's my personality type. Here's what I, you know, this is how I like to be approached. This is when I best chat, in, am I a morning person? Am I an afternoon person? Um, here's some books I'm reading, and it's a really nice just kind of icebreaker uh, to kind of get to know somebody without having to, you know, approach them maybe at a time they don't really want to be approached. Uh, user manuals, I'm a big fan of them. Um, so let's move into, uh, let's see, we're down to 13 minutes here, and there's a couple questions I definitely want to get to. Let's do, this one looks good. So Ivo, I'm curious to know, uh, how are companies celebrating their employee successes and how are managers re-motivating teams when objectives are not met? Yeah, so I think one aspect that we need to also mention when we're talking about remote is that with 
about remote, it's about the choice. And the choice can be that you still would like to be on site. Uh, and this should be an option. So this kind of there is this world where we are remote first, but will allow people to actually be wherever they are. And that kind of uh, differentiates uh, how we um, how we operate. So uh, one thing that uh, I really wanted to emphasize, and we get a lot of questions about that, if you're going remote, it doesn't mean that you're not meeting uh, in person, doesn't mean that you don't have retreats. Uh, so the initiatives like you met here doing that, that the retreat in, in Barcelona, this is a perfect moment to get together, to learn from each other, to motivate, to, to your question, to motivate, not just on Slack or during the meeting, but actually to, to get together in person, speak, um, talk openly about the challenges, um, et cetera. So this is just something that I wanted to, um, to mention that remote doesn't mean always uh, remote. So we are big supporters when, when companies are organizing retreats like that. I was a big fan watching when Chase organized a retreat in Switzerland this summer for Dewey's team. I was a bit jealous. Uh, so there are, this is, this is already, already happening. Um, and when it comes to the, the, the remote remote setup and, and what leaders should do. Leaders should be authentic. Uh, leaders should trust um, and leaders should be mentors and no longer be like a boss, right? So there's uh, this giant shift that needs to happen within their mindsets. Uh, even before we start speaking about the operational side and then processes and rituals, because today it's really about changing stuff here and then we can figure out how we wanted to operationalize it right um so the the part where companies neglected uh the leadership development soft skills etc is over period uh, and right now we need to be um we need to invest in 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 this aspect and then it's super complex so we don't have time to uh, to talk about it but i wanted to encourage if we have some some folks from from HR or, or team leaders to encourage their companies to 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 put some time aside to, to put resources into into investing in uh, in your uh, in your people. Yeah, you nailed it. I'd say trust is such a big component of remote work, and also understanding that remote doesn't necessarily always mean one hundred percent remote. Uh, intentionally gathering, intentionally in person gatherings are so powerful. There's a wonderful book called. Uh, the Art of Gathering, that's essentially our Bible over here as experience creators, that really talks about, you know, what is the purpose of bringing your people together? Um, a lot of people say, or I'm hearing a lot now that people are saying company culture is made in the office. Uh, and when everyone's in the office, they can do the happy hours, they can do the in-person events. But what I think that they're missing is the intentionality of what are they doing? You know, a happy hour is fun and all, um, but there's really no no purpose behind it between besides just you know going out for drinks through coworkers. Uh, so I always challenge people to really think about like why are you gathering? Like what's the real reason why we're coming together at a company retreat? And yes, the art of gathering is correct, Julia, based on your comment. Really cool what you book. said, uh, Ivo, about um, leaders uh, being authentic. I would like to add something on that. Um, to what I've seen, to what we've seen with, uh, with the Boson project is that um, you can really move people and teams and your company when leaders give the example of what you want to see in people. They embrace that figure and that whatever you want to see in people, they, they do it themselves and they show up doing it. So for example, if you're organizing a retreat or if you're organizing uh, some sort of event uh, where the idea is uh, we want you guys to be uh, um, fully on board on that program and so forth, leaders should show up, should participate and should, should show their involvement in that project. And they should put their faces in there and they should be authentic about it. I really like what you uh, Ivo said um, about showing vulnerability and, and showing the, you know, the human and the true aspect of what we're doing. Leaders are not meant to be perfect. They also have their uh, uh, down moments and so forth. The idea is to um, share uh, share what you're going through and look for 
um, look for answers together. And um, so, so yeah, the, give, a, give the example and embrace uh, what you want to see in other people, I see, very important. Wonderful. So Andrew, I wanna tap you back in. Uh, I'm curious, so how are you managing your productivity uh, while maintaining the culture you want? And what are the different metrics that you can use to measure performance of your, of your teams? You know, results, results matter. As you talked about productivity, it's a thing of, okay, keeping folks accountable with dates and times and goals and everyone, I, I'll speak for myself. I like structure. I like goals. I can't hit the moon if I don't know that's my target. And I, I think others do as well. Um, and so using, using tools, we use Monday as a project management software. So if there's a project, putting dates when it's due, uh, marking it, if it's priority, if it's you know keeping things in a in measurable um, parameters is key. So having the right tools in place so that people know um, what is expected and then holding people, holding us each to account for that. If we've hit it, if we haven't, um, let them know, okay, that was, it was needed by that time. That was, was expressly communicated for that purpose and uh, holding, holding that value that results matter uh, to the scale that you actually value it. Mm. Yeah, I like that. It also, it also works the other way around, Andrew. Um, so something something that works really well uh, is um, coming uh, designing uh, management guidelines. What's that? Basically, it's um, the opposite of um, I'm a manager and this is what I expect from you guys. These are um, your objectives is working the other way around. I am the employee and what I really want to see in the management style and what kind of direction, what kind of guidance I want to see, that also uh, helps in making the, the whole organization uh, work well together. Wonderful, I wish you could speak on that for another 15 minutes. <laughs> One, because I'd love to hear you say it. I'd love to hear what you're, you're saying there and to unpack that further because there are so many in management and leadership that need to hear and need to understand how people um, communicate and how they learn and how they need to be managed. Because if, if there's not healthy communication, you don't get the results that you're expecting. Some people can't just look at a software and see a date or get an email and, and understand what the parameters are because they're coming from a, an environment that's never been remote and they had management that didn't communicate clearly previously. So we all come into situations with different filters. And so Virginia, you, you hit on something that needs to be its own, its own segment there. Thank you. So Virginia, I'd love to follow up with that. I'm curious, you know, what, are, what are people doing to mitigate against you know, isolation and burnout and promote just good mental health for their, for their teams? Plenty of things. Um, definitely uh, stuff that come from the in real life world. So for example, the very basic is uh, to work in environments that do good do good to the soul, to the spirit. So for, on, for, for real uh, environments, we're talking about having gardens uh, and office space or uh, ha having healthy food or sports facilities. And when we're talking about um, remote companies, it's basically all that, but um, delivered to you via a subscription. So for example, um, a lot of companies here in France uh, subscribe to uh, Gymlib, which is a uh, gym uh, su subscription that allows you to, um, any, um, uh, any employee to uh, pick uh, wherever uh, he or she wants to um, do sports. Uh, so th these are kind of, you know, like very basic 
um, office uh, or, or work uh, elements. What I really like um, is what is being discussed right now in the French government, for example, which is basically having a certain budget that is mandatory from the company to the employee. It, it's equivalent of a 600 euro per year that the company will have to give to the employee to make sure that he or she works in a nice environment. You could buy uh, desks and uh, IT stuff. You could use it for um, uh, gathering um, activities with uh, other colleagues. Uh, it's up to you to decide, but basically, uh, it's the idea of reversing some of the expenditures that companies don't have anymore on the actual office space. In Europe, it's in France, it's around 10K to 13K per person of expenditure for having an actual physical space for the uh, employee. So yeah, the, the balance, it's not fantastic you know you're you used to be spent 10000 euro now you spent 600 euro for uh, allowing your employee to have a great uh, work environment but still it's something um i've seen um i don't know what you guys think of that one but mental health apps that basically uh, you can plug into the whatever uh, erp or uh, tool that you're using in your company and it will be about um, having access to all sorts of pra practitioners um, that will be able to uh, will be available to you on one to one sessions. So, for example, psychologists, hypnotherapists, or uh, communication experts. Um, so, uh, so yeah, th this us by I will. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to, to see what uh, the other guys are are, are looking uh, are seeing in this spectrum. Are those uh, mental health apps or um, other kind of budgets being allocated successful? I'll I'll speak into what we do at Insured Nomads, and that is that we provide unlimited mental health uh, therapy. That's uh, by video by. Um, text or phone in provided in different languages. And uh, it's one of those things where I, I decided, okay, we're providing this, so I better use it myself. And I've really benefited from it. It's uh, mental health is one of the things that we often as a society ignore. And whether it's a life coach, executive coach, career coach, or all the way to a licensed professional counselor. It's um, providing these opportunities for people to grow is, is essential, I believe. Absolutely. And I think you you touched on it too, Virginia, that it's it's really worth the investment in your people's well-being, um, especially if you are remote. Yeah. I don't know what it is in Paris, but I did see something about in New York, the average employee or uh, it costs something between 10 to $15,000 just to have a desk in New York City. So if remote teams are saving that kind of overhead, you know, it's very much worth reinvesting that into the overall well-being of their teams and, and doing, you know, in-person stuff and mental health apps and gym memberships and all these kinds of fun things. Um, so it's nice to see companies that are really embracing this, this department, if you will. So we're at the top of the hour. I know we're probably going to lose a couple people here who have to jump. Uh, we do have another 30 minutes for some live Q&A. Uh, before we transition to that, I do want to plug our 30-day remote leaders intensive program coming up in November. Uh, we are accepting applications until the end of the month, so definitely check out our website, nomadic6.com, to learn more about that. If you want to hear from our speakers a little more, uh, Chase and Ivo and Virginia will be there in November if everything goes according to plan. So definitely join us there. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Caroline, who's going to take some questions from the audience. 
Hello, everyone. I have been looking at all of the questions coming through. Uh, one thing that I'm loving seeing in the chat is you're answering each other's questions. So it's a great community vibe in the chat there. Uh, I did want to pull out a few questions that I don't think has been touched on yet. Uh, and this is from us asking ahead of time. We got hundreds of questions, as well as the questions that are coming through now. Uh, Chase, I have one for you uh, around contractors. So one of our attendees asked, says that our organizational staffing is very heavy on the contractor side. What are some ways to keep a healthy remote culture when there are limitations in what you can offer a contractor versus what you can offer a full-time employee. I would love to know a bit more about what limitations they're, they're feeling. Um, the way, the way we approach this is we have uh, a mix of people who are, we have some part-time contractors, some full-time contractors, we have full-time employees, um, so we, we run the gamut. The only area where we really separate the two are the part-time contractors who we see is just fulfilling. Like, um, for instance, we offer all of our apps and in, in marketing in 18 different languages. So we outsource the, the translations to, uh, to part-time contractors. We work with the same contractor for, for each language, but we sort of see them as external of the company. Um, and so therefore they're a little bit less, uh, they get a little bit less access to some of the things that we're that we're doing um, internally. But the people who are full time contractors uh, who, are, who are pretty involved in the day to day of the company, we welcome them in um, and pretty much treat them like full time employees. The uh, the only exception to that rule might be our company retreats, where we uh, where we actually twice a year we bring people to a co located place uh, somewhere in the world and, and bring the team together. So we're getting some face-to-face -to -face time to, to serve those, uh, the extroverts and, and really everybody that's just craving that. Um, so that, that would be the only thing we leave them out of. But I mean, aside from that, I don't think there's, I, I, I could be wrong, you know, somebody correct me if I'm, if I'm uh, mistaken here, but I don't think there's anything preventing you from, from treating a contractor more or less the same way that you're, you're treating your full-time employees. It might be the other way around where it's hard to uh, hard to give some of the the benefits to a full time employee that you may want to if they're if you're unable to make them a full time employee. But um, as far as perks and benefits, if we can't provide, for instance, like insurance in a country or contribute to their social security or something like that, that would be uh, a norm as a full time employee in that country. Then we try to figure out ways which we can do that via other means. We we reimburse for them to buy their own private health insurance as an example. Um, so I think you have to get really creative. I mean, there's a, the employer of record, uh, the EOR space, um, companies like Oyster and, and uh, remote.com and others are providing a lot of avenues to pretty much make contractors uh, come in as, as full-time employees for all taxation, legal uh, benefits, perks, uh, from all those standpoints. So you can actually, if you choose to do it, if you, if you choose to invest in that, you can, you can often get around a lot of the, the challenges that were faced more traditionally just, just a couple years ago. But it's a, I probably am missing something within that question, admittedly, um, because there's, it's, it's very nuanced. It depends on the location and distribution of the company and, and what specific problems they're facing. But hopefully that, that adds a little bit to the, uh, to, to the question. Virginia, did you have anything to add on to that question around contractors? No, good. And Andrew? No, very well addressed. Perfect. Well, Andrew, I'll give this next one to you. Uh, the question is, how do you prevent tunnel vision? Getting back into the office, you overhear conversations and can add value just because you're in the same room. How do you transfer knowledge in seconds rather than setting up meetings or chat sessions? There's an aspect to that question of getting back into the office that kind of threw me there because that's not in my vision for the future. As a fully remote company, that that, that element threw me. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, I think it's just the idea that when you're in the office, it's very easy right. to hear conversations, True. jump in. Uh, but yes. obviously, it's a little bit harder if you're not scheduling. Yes, having those channels to where you can't, you are able to message people. 
and and keep in keep in front of them is crucial it's it takes intentionality for for many types for for many people to to do that and they their teams need to take responsibility for doing that uh, to keep in touch and to to keep the social elements going whether it's through teams and uh, some prefer whatsapp just because when they're social, that's that's the channel they go to. So it's finding the the channel that they're going to respond on, and um, like the cozy office that I referenced earlier is wonderful because I end up with folks dropping by or or see people gathered in somebody else's space, and all of a sudden I'll see somebody else popped in over there, and it's it's just that interactive. Uh, environment to where people do get a chance to to socialize, even though they're a long distance apart. One question that Matt and I received ahead of time that we both loved and were very intrigued about, and I'll open it up to whoever potentially has this in their teams, is how do you develop a culture across different generations within the one team? So either, does anyone in the panel have that specific situation? You have many generations in your team and how do you really focus on building the culture around that? Maybe I'll quote the example of co-living. So in co-living, obviously it's uh, people living together. So not really a remote organization, but um, there has been some operators now that have taken that road of wanting uh, to develop intergenerational inter living. And um, su surprisingly or not, uh, what really works in this kind of context is the uh, exchange of favors that different generations can uh, provide. So for example, you would have like the older person that ha doesn't have uh, so much time, um, so much occupation because uh, he, he or she is a uh, retired and you have like the younger person with kids uh, that wants to uh, find solution for his kid. Um, so the older person will babysit basically the, the younger person in the common spaces. So there is this sense of uh, exchanging favors, exchanging, um, yeah, exchanging favors. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that could work in, a, in an organization, you know, what what are the stuff that at me as an older person can I, I do have that the other generations don't have and that would like to uh, learn from me and vice versa. So it's, it's all about sharing, in my opinion, uh, what really, uh, what, what is your experience on, on the life that you had and sharing it with the other generations. I and think it's a, a reason for that. It's a really interesting question, and and the one of the things that's kind of uh, extremely interesting, I think, to think about is a company like Duist, for example, was built remote first from the very beginning. So, as Virginia alluded to earlier, the the onboarding of an employee starts even before you hire them, right? So, we're the way that we're screening for people, the way that we're the people type of people that we're hiring have a similar skill set, have a similar way of communicating. All of these things transcend age differences, generational differences in a lot of ways. So you, when you come into the company, you already have these core things in mind uh, in, in common. But a company transitioning to remote may not have that benefit. And it's a pain that a lot of them are feeling because you're, you're bringing, you're, influ you're suddenly going into the digital world there's a whole new set of guidelines. There's a whole new set of tools to use. Um, and you have people coming from different backgrounds and different ways of working who weren't necessarily hired to work in this way. And so you're having to rethink these things. And, and so um, I, think, I think Andrew and, and Virginia have uh, even better examples of this than, than I do because I don't have, we don't have that experience having, having been built the way that we were, but I see tons of teams facing this challenge. So it's really interesting, something that I'm, I'm learning and, and taking away from this discussion. I, I think it's a, I'm glad the question was asked. 
Andrew, did you have uh, any response to that question or I can jump to the next one? We can jump to the next one because I realize there are a few questions and where our time is rapidly passing. There's a lot of questions and curiosity. It's great. I am going to jump to one that I don't think we've touched on and it is how do you deal with low performing employees who are really struggling remote, working remotely? Andrew, would you like to start with that question? Um, actually, I would love to hear Chase's response on that because he has more experience than I do in that area. Yeah, we have a lot of low performing people. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate <laughs> no, that. No, I, no. I'm no. joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're I'm totally kidding. Uh, yeah, it, right. is, it is a huge, this is a huge challenge uh, because it, it can be hard to see, right? You're not in the same office. You're not seeing them uh, struggle through things. And so one of the things that I think is really important is, is the way that you, you, your, your company is set up to, to work, to make this easily recognizable. Um, so we're, we're very outcome driven in remote, remote teams that function at a high level. You're very outcome driven. You're not getting a lot of credit just for showing up. Um, you're not getting a lot of credit just for, you know, being present on, on calls because those calls don't exist or being in meetings because those meetings don't exist often. So we're very outcome driven. It's pretty black and white to see if somebody's succeeding or not succeeding at their work. What's harder though, is that the nuance in between, you know, how is somebody feeling? How are they, how are they doing day to day? Um, yeah, maybe they're getting the work done, but maybe they're miserable every day and you can't see them. So being very intentional as a leader and, and as, a, as a leader of leaders, setting up the infrastructure to make sure that people, um, that your leaders have the ability to peer in on this and to, and to have the space to make sure that this is a priority is so, so important in a, in a remote environment. So, I mean, I think leaders of remote teams, people that are managing other people, this is like their number one job to make sure that their team is not suffering from, from overwork, burnout, um, to be, to really keep their finger on the pulse. So that means like, you know, frequent check-ins, checking in on how they're doing personally, um, looking at the work objectively, but then trying to really dig into how they're doing, um, personally and, and raise them up. It may be that you have to, that that's a really good situation when someone's struggling, when you switch to a more synchronous environment. So a lot of remote teams are like asynchronous by default, but then when someone's struggling, that means more one-on-one -on -one sessions. That means perhaps more brainstorming sessions with them live to figure out how you can elevate their work. Um, so thinking through that, getting them partnered up with a mentor or someone who can, who can help them. Um, and also going back and revising, like, is the work that they're doing really what lights them up? Um, the jobs can be fluid and we can, we have abilities to, to change and, and, and shift gears. So um, I think it's important to go back constantly and be revising to, uh, to make sure that people are doing what really lights them up. That goes to, for remote or anywhere, but. <laughs> well, to stay on that topic, there's been a lot of questions around onboarding and it would be great to finish as maybe the final question with some really tactical uh, advice around what are those key pieces for, especially for employees that are transitioning to now remote work? How do you really cross that bridge of making sure that they have everything they need to thrive in a remote environment when potentially they may have come from, uh, let's say, 100% office-based work. So what are the, it, maybe if each of you can give one strategy or two that you're using to really, for our audience, if they have employees, team members that they're onboarding that have potentially don't have experience in remote work yet, how they can really start to bridge that gap. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start first. Um, yeah. When you say transition, you automatically say a process, a process that takes time, right? So um, to me, to us, it's essential to uh, be able to measure what's happening in all that process and understand from wherever the employee is going, whatever are his or her um, skills and familiarity with the intended objective environment. Uh, you want to assess that. You want to be able to put in place the right tools. And then you want to do some check-ins 
in order, like along the way, in, in the middle of the process, let's say it's a three month process, you have decided that you want to measure what's going on during the three months, you're gonna do a, um, a one and a half uh, month sort of like check-in and assess what's going and um, uh, pivot and try new things when, when things are not uh, working out. And then at the end, do again uh, another um, sort of uh, re retext, um, like feed feedback. And, um, and, and once you've done this with uh, tens of hundreds of people, you have figured out what you can do and what is constantly a problem and uh, you sort of kind of can come up with a, uh, a process. Chase, uh, what about, uh, you know, you're 100% remote already, but are there some strategies for new people coming on board to the teams that work really well in your environment? It's nothing uh, mind blowing. I don't think uh, no, no like uh, big secret sauce here, but I, I think just basically going back to first principles and, and really thinking about like as a company, how do we work? You know, what's really core to the way that we work and then sharing that with new hires. Um, so we have like several books and articles that will reference uh, some written by others, some articles written by us, threads within Twist, where we do all our communication that that um, that showcase, you know, this is a really good example of how communication looks like and how we work and how we collaborate. Um, and so those are all baked into that that to do us project that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they give people a very actionable way to go through and say to get a feel for okay, this is how we're going to work here. This is this is the way things move from point A to point B, and um, and and then they can go back and reference those later. So. Uh, that's, that's something that's been really, really key to us. And I will also say like, we have, we've had really good retention over 15 years at Duist, uh, hovering in the 94 to 96% rate. Um, people don't leave often when they, but when they do, they, it's generally because remote wasn't a good fit for them. Um, and so getting that right is like, like we can almost nail that down to 100% of the time when someone leaves, that's the reason. Um, so getting that right is is really important. That's the reason for mentioning that. Communication, you know, whether that's written, uh, as Chase has just said, the verbal, the, the different channels, I think is where success and failure lies in onboarding, in moving people through the processes. As I've listened to things that were said today, I've realized, wow, we need to improve this. Or, uh, you know, we, we learn through all these different uh, interactions. And I believe that having the proper communication map, the roadmap, and improving that consistently is, is the key. I'll jump back in here. We are at 1220, we're in our last 10 minutes. Everything's been so enlightening. I think this is huge value. Uh, for those that are still wondering, we are uh, going to have this session on YouTube and we have three more scheduled. We're going to do these once a month until the end of the year. So our next one is going to be all about um, it leading and engaging remote teams. And we'll announce the speakers in the next coming weeks. We'll keep it kind of a surprise until then. Um, but stay tuned for that one. Of course, our 30 day remote leaders intensive is coming up very soon. Head over to our website. I just posted a link in the chat to get more information on that. We are only accepting 30 people to that and we are requiring at least three representatives per organization. So space will fill up fast. And in honor of uh, the art of gathering as uh, the author so wonderfully says, never start uh, a gathering with logistics and never end a gathering with logistics. So in that spirit, I'm gonna leave you guys with a little bit of homework. And I encourage you to write these questions down, think about them later. Uh, and these questions are from another wonderful book. So I'm just combining all the books today. Uh, this book is called The Road Less Stupid. And it's a little abrasive, but it's a fantastic business Bible. And this comes from the section on company culture. So in your reflections, 
in your thinking time, what is the culture that you have now? Make a list of how people treat each other, both good and bad. What is the culture that you want to create? Make a list. If this was the worst, most toxic workplace, what would it look like? Make a list and then think of the opposite. What would the culture, culture look like if it were to become the employee, uh, the, the company of choice, the, the best version of a company culture? What are the beliefs that employees must have that have led them to the culture that you currently have? And what are the new beliefs that employees must have if you are able to construct the new vision of how to treat each other? What are the specific rituals we can create that will reinforce and memorialize our new culture. Generally, the rule of thumb with thinking time is I like to pen and paper, technology off, no distractions, and just go through these questions and just write the answers. As the author says, uh, the first answer is never the right one. It's usually the sixth answer. So sit with these, and I fully encourage you to check out these books. Um, I can send these questions, Jamie, on a follow-up. Any closing thoughts? Anything you guys want to add? I know Chase just had a jump. Wow, those questions really stimulated some thoughts, uh, phone calls I'd like to make, some some things that need to be done. This that was good. I you almost have to ask those again. Uh, it's it's a thing of they were so loaded. They are. Wow. They, yeah, that was just a taste. I'm gonna. I, I think that a lot of people are curious. Uh, I'll definitely send out a follow up email with these questions, or I encourage you to check out the book because they are very thought provoking. Um, guys, this has been great. Virginia, thank you so much for your input. Andrew, love speaking with you. You're the ball of energy that I love to have around. Ivro and Chase, you you already jumped, but you'll probably see this recording. Thank you for your time, and. We'll see you guys in Barcelona. Very excited for, yes. for that program. <laughs> and thank Caroline, you all for joining. Also, yeah, Caroline, thank you so much for taking care of that Q&A section. You're, you're amazing. Yes. I love working with you. You're fantastic. And we'll see you guys October 13th for the next panel. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Cheers. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you. <laughs>